Well, hello, everybody. Um, like Pastor Pam said, um, when I married my wife, Grace, I moved over to the Philippines to do so. And I was there for six months. And, well, after our honeymoon, which was about a month, her mother says, time to get to work. <laughs> what? I thought I was just here to have fun for six months. She goes, no, I want you to go over there and go, go speak over there. I'm like, really? And um, so one Sunday afternoon, she says, um, well, I got this little church that was a Bible study, and they became a church a couple months ago, and the pastor that was over it, he decided to leave. She goes, I want you to give a message. So I went over there and gave a message and said, oh, okay. I guess that went okay. So I come back, and the next thing I know, the elders of the church come over to her mother and said, we want Steve to be our pastor. <laughs> what? I go, well, I'm leaving in three months, a little over three months. She says, that's all right, you be a pastor till you leave. Well, I go, oh, great. So I did. And um, it was a big experience for me. I, uh, one thing I learned from it, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a special uh, disposition to really pastor people and I appreciate Pam because she's there and a pastor in my mind is someone who goes after the people seeks after people seeks after their good seeks after their upbuilding and uh, and I tell everybody I'm not a pastor especially when I'm in the Philippines I tell them I'm not a pastor I'm a teacher because when what a teacher does is he gives insight into the Word of God, and that's what I love to do. I write, um, and I write, and I write, because the Holy Spirit just starts pouring stuff in me, and it's like, wow. And that leads me to how I came to our sister Pam. Um, one day I was at work, and I was just, you know, when Pam said, this is the year of the king, I'm like, wow. Haven't heard that expression before. And um, so I started thinking about that. I hmm, wonder what, what does that mean? What does year of the king mean? Well, it was a couple of weeks later that the Holy Spirit started giving me insight. Amen. I'm just at work doing my job, and all of a sudden, <laughs> pouring it in. I'm like, that's interesting. And so, so I approached the pastor and said, I really think the Lord wants to wants to share some things, insights about what it, year of the king means. So that's why I'm here. Anyway, um, a little story. There were four men standing up on a cliff edge, and they were looking down at the valley. And um, the first man was a really angry man. His name was Meany. The second man, he was very strong, built like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And they called him Mighty. And the third man, well, he was just a landscape artist, and he used to mow a lot of grasses, so his name was Mo. <laughs> and, uh, and there's the fourth man, and everybody just called him Pastor. He was just Pastor. Okay? So all of a sudden, a big strong wind comes along, and Pastor falls overhead first. As soon as he starts falling, a voice comes out of heaven and says, Meanie, Miney, Mo, catch that Pastor by the toe. So Mighty reaches down and grabs Pastor by the toe, and he says something. He's like, he goes to, says to Mo, I think he's hollering something. Well, Mo says, what's he hollering? I don't know. I can't make it out, but all I can make out is, let me go. Let me go. He's saying, but that's not all what he's saying, but all I'm hearing is, let me go. Okay. Moral of the story is, don't let your pastor go when you got her by the toe. <laughs> anyway, isn't it, aren't we, isn't it wonderful that God doesn't let us go? I'm glad he's got, got us by more than just a toe. He's got us by our heart. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for humor. Thank you for um, giving us words and insights on, on the year of the king. We ask that you just open our ears to hear what you have to say to us and uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. 
In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Okay. So, um, like I said, I'm one that likes to ask a lot of questions. And when I hear things like, it's the year of the king, I started asking the Lord, what is that? What, what does that look like? What is so, the Lord just spoke to me one day and says, ask me a question. What do kings do? I don't know. We have a president. We don't have a king. So uh, he started ministering to me, and I, there's three points I want to tell you. What a king does, besides ruling a kingdom, is he primarily negotiates peace treaties with other countries. Okay? Our president is like a king. President Trump, President Obama, President all the presidents are like kings, okay? They, they're the ones that sit down with the heads or the leaders of other countries, and they, they negotiate treaties, okay? Ambassadors have somewhat to do with that, but it's usually the president or the king that negotiates peace treaties. Um, a second point is, especially in biblical terms, a king would judge special cases, Okay, they had judges, and they would. But when there was a specially hard case, they'd bring it to the king, and the king would make his judgment on it. And the third point is, is a king would go out to battle at certain times of the year. Okay, now the king would send his generals out and his armies out, and they'd battle for however long the wars went on. But at certain times of the year, and we learned that through our sister Pam here that. David was supposed to go out to battle, but when kings go out to battle, it says. So there were certain times of the year when a king would go out to battle. And um, so these three main points I want to touch on, I probably won't get on all of them today, um, but I want to go with this first one. Um, if, if you can turn to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1. This is the, one of the first things that the, the Lord showed me is that kings, especially biblical kings, were kind of like foreshadows of Jesus, the king of kings, okay? Although they didn't do it like they should have, and if you just read the book of Kings or Chronicles, you'll see that the majority of them didn't do it like they should have done it, okay? But there's one king who did do it right, at least in the beginning of his kingship, and that's King Solomon, okay? Of all the kings, the, the nation of Israel did not have peace like they did under King Solomon. His whole reign, it says that there was peace in the land, throughout the whole land. So what was associated with King Solomon was peace. Now, King Solomon, negotiated, the first thing he did well, the second thing, because the first thing he did was ask for wisdom, okay? At least he was, he was in the early days, he was sm smart enough to realize he needed wisdom to be able to rule as a good king. And so the first thing we see in Kings chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. So first thing Solomon did was he decided, I'm going to make peace with my neighboring empires. Okay. Now, in biblical history, Egypt was a mighty, mighty nation. They conquered a lot of other countries. They, they had a mighty uh, army. They, they were a strong, formidable force. But Solomon, being wise, decided, I'm going to make an affinity with him. And all affinity means is he got married to Pharaoh's daughter. Okay? That was the way they did it back then. They married into a neighboring king's family 
so that they would bring peace between the two nations. Okay. And, um, and then we have uh, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 12. Wow, it's already there. You're good. <laughs> Okay, and it says in there, it says, And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom, as he promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they made a league together. Or in other words, they made a treaty, an agreement. So they came together in an agreement. So he, he joined forces with Hiram, which was up to the north of him. And uh, what what happens with them is Hiram was the one who provided all the materials for the temple in Jerusalem. He provided all the wood, all the stone, all the ivory, all the gold, everything. So he made an agreement with Hiram. So he started making agreements with every king around him that surrounded his nation. And he brought about peace. Now, how does this play in with Jesus, the king of kings? Well, when Jesus becomes our king, when we accept him, he makes peace with all that is around us. Amen. The Proverbs says that, Proverbs 16, 7 says, when a man's way please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. So the first thing the king does, he makes peace. Okay. And the king of kings is making peace for you, 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 I, making peace for, he makes peace externally. He makes peace internally. Okay. You know that word peace in the Hebrew is actually shalom. Okay. And shalom, in essence, means wholeness and my wife likes to say nothing missing nothing broken and no darkness at all he makes peace outside of us and he makes peace inside of us he makes us whole okay so um he, he makes us whole okay now if we'll go to judges chapter 3 verse 16 we're going to touch on the second point here, how a king judges special cases. Wow. Don't think that's the one. Oops. <laughs> Typo error. Anyway, I'll just tell you the story. There's a story where when Solomon's hasn't been king very long and there's a case that's brought to him there's two women they're fighting over a child okay and the one woman saying she stole my child and the other woman's no that's my that's my child and it belongs to me and they're they're getting they're having a they're having a all-out brawl before the king they're saying that's my child that's my child no, no, you stole it. No, you stole it from me. No, you stole it. Blah, 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 blah. And Solomon says, okay, bring me a sword. We're going to cut this child in half. We're going to give half to you and half to you. And the mother of the child said, ah, just give her to, to her. It's her child. And Solomon understood that she was the real mother. Okay, so Sol like I said, Solomon is a type and a picture of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. And so what, what Jesus does for us is when we're going through a hard time in our life and there needs to be some kind of decision made, he's our judge. What a judge does in, in our day and age is he makes decisions on cases, okay? You broke the law. You stand before the judge. The judge says, here's the facts and says, okay, here's my decision. 30 days probation. Go clean up trash. Okay. So there's times in our lives when we are 
we have, uh, we don't know what to do, okay? We've got hard situation to face. And as we know from our sister, Pastor Pam, she's had hard situation to face lately. Well, the Lord is working from his throne, judging, making decisions. on What should I do for my daughter, my sister, Pam? What should I do for you when you're going through a hard situation? He's making decisions for us, okay? When we don't know what to do, he makes decisions for us, and he passes that along to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit gives us the insight, okay? So that's another thing that a king does. He makes decisions and helps us get through circumstances that we just don't know how to get through, okay? Third point is, is that a king goes out to battle at certain points. Now, you might think, you know, a king, you know, he should just stay in his palace, you know. Well, we found out that when they do, they get in trouble. <laughs> okay. But think about this. The soldiers have been out fighting for 9, 10, 11, who knows, a year and a half, and they're weary. And they're feeling like, we ain't never going to win this battle. Okay? But, so one of the things a king does when he goes out there is he encourages. All right, I'm here. You can do it. Okay? And I'm going to lead the charge this time. Okay? I'm going to lead the charge. So what king does is he leads the charge. When we're weary battling Workplace scenarios, family scenarios, Jesus leads the charge. He takes control of the battle, okay? So, how we are seeing the movie Braveheart? Yes, well, I forget what the character's name was, but what was it? William Wallace. William Wallace. <laughs> Amen. Well... William Wallace would get out there and give them the big speech and saying, we can do it. We're going to win this. And he'd go out in front of them and, and they'd be, for William and for our king, you know, for, for king and country. You know, so, so these three points, like I said, negotiating peace treaties, negotiating peace for us, judging special cases, and going out to battle at certain times. See, the Lord gives us the strength to battle, but, you know, we get weary. We live in this, you know, body of flesh, and it gets weary. And so he gets out there. Um, so he gets out there, and um, he battles for us. Now, I want to just touch on um, that first scripture we went to, 1 Kings 3.1, affinity. Now, when I, the Lord woke me up at 4.30, somewhere around there this morning, started talking to me. I'm like, you know, I really want to sleep. <laughs> but, and I rolled over, and I rolled over again, and I'm like, I can't get to sleep. I, <sighs> All right, so I get up. About 5 o'clock, I get up, and I walk out in the living room. Okay, what do you do? Okay. And he starts talking to me about affinity. And um, that, that part about affinity is when you make a marriage. There's a marriage made between two countries. There's a marriage made between two people, Pharaoh and Solomon. Well, I looked that word up in the dictionary. Well, actually, on my phone. Um, <laughs> who even reads a dictionary anymore, you know? But anyway, it, it said, becoming one in nature with another. I'm like, wow. So when we make an affinity with our Lord, we become one in nature with our Lord. Okay. And um, so, and I'm, I was just reminded on the way over here this morning that, you know, not only do, does the Lord make affinity with us, but we can make an affinity with him. 
And a good example of that is in the story of Ruth. You know, we all know the story. Ruth's husband dies. Naomi's got two sons and a husband. He d husband dies, two sons die. And we got Ruth and I don't know who the other woman's name was. And she says, go back to your people. And the other woman says, fine, see you later. But Ruth says, no, I want to be your people, and I want your God to be my God. She made an affinity with Ruth. She made an affinity with Ruth's God. She says, I want you to be my God, Amen. and I want your ways to be my way. Amen. Okay? So we can make an affinity with the Lord are we making his ways our ways? And are we making Jesus is God our God? Okay. Now Jesus, he's the king of kings. But there's someone over Jesus, his father. There's someone that Jesus called his God, which was his father in heaven. So we make an affinity with Jesus saying, I want your father to be my father. And this is, what, this is what happens when we make an affinity. Or when he makes an affinity with us, he says, all right, now you're my son, and I'm your father. We're now connected. You're going to be like me, and I'll be like you in the end. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through, God. You don't know what kind of life I live. He says, don't worry, I'm making an affinity here, okay? In the end, you will be like me, and I will be like you. Amen? Amen? And um, so it's a wonderful thing that the Lord, the Lord uh, has chosen to make an affinity with us, okay? Now, part of that whole making an affinity thing is, is that there's a process in that. It just doesn't happen overnight. Oh, I'm super Christian now. I've been with the Lord two weeks now. I'm doing it just right. <laughs> How many people here has that happened to? Anybody? Come on, raise your hand. We got one back there. No, it doesn't happen that way, does it? No, it takes years. It takes a lifetime sometimes. Okay, but he's working on us. Okay, he's making us like him. Okay, and um, yes, and so, so I got to thinking about this. Okay, he's making us like us, but how does this look? Like I said, I like to ask a lot of questions. How does this look? And the Holy Spirit reminded me of a scenario in my life that... Um, that it caused me a lot of heartache as I was growing in the Lord. I had a f best friend in high school. I know y'all had best friends, right? Best friend. And we were like two peas in a pod. His mother called me her fifth son. I mean, it was like, it was like part of the family. And, and well, that we got saved about three months apart. And, uh, all of a sudden, his direction went that way, and my direction went this way, and, and I just couldn't understand why he never would call me. This went on for years, and I call his mother, why is your son doing this to me? Why is he not answering my phone calls? Why is he, what have I done to offend him? She's like, ask him, what are you asking me for? I'd try and call, no answers. And never did really get an answer for a lot of years. And then the Lord told me this morning, you know, even though he was your best friend, I'm a better friend that sticks closer than a brother. Yeah. Okay? You know, I had a, a, a home group leader tell me a long time ago. He said, she said, Steve, you want to get closer to the Lord? The closer you want to get to the Lord, the farther you'll get away from your friends and family. And 
I kind of refused that. I said, no, no way. Because family's important to me. Okay? I said, that, I just refused to hear. But time told, told a story. And one by one, they all went their own direction. They got married. They went off to other churches. And I, it was like this big hole in my heart. Why is this happening to me? Am I doing something wrong? Never got an answer. But the Lord said this morning, I want you to see that I'm the one who's your best friend. Amen. I'm the one who will carry you through. Okay, you can run to your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can run to your mother or your father when a hard time's happening. But it's Jesus himself who will carry us through. It's Jesus himself who will battle for us during those times. Okay? It's Jesus himself who will make the decision what we should do. Amen? Amen? Well, this is just kind of a characteristic of what a king does. Okay? This is what the king does from the moment we accept him as our king. He does all this for us. But when it comes down to year of the king, which is a special, a special season, if you want to call it, okay? A year is a season, okay? We have seasons that we celebrate. Easter season, Christmas season, St. Patrick's Day. There are seasons, times and seasons, that the Lord gets up and decides, okay, now it's my turn. Good, good. Okay? He sends his soldiers out to battle. He sends his ambassadors to other countries to do, negotiate things. He sends, but there's times when a king says, it's my turn. It's my turn to work. Sure, I mean, I'm sure those kids, Little thrones have padded seats on there, and they feel comfortable, you know? But a king, a good king, knows when it's time for him to work, okay? And I believe what the Lord's been showing me is that we're entering a season where it's time for the king to work. Amen. He's going to work on behalf of his people. Amen. He's going to bring peace in situations not only on an individual level, but on corporate levels. There'll be church splits that will mend their ways. There'll be whole nations that will see revivals. He's going to bring peace. He's going to bring wholeness. Where, you know, we're, we like to do stuff as humans. The church likes to do stuff. Program for this, program for that, program. Let's go out and do this. Let's go out and do that. And they, sometimes they're successful. Sometimes they're very successful. But when the Lord says it's time for me, yep. he plans on doing something that's going to be notable. Amen. That word notable. Now, I put a little note down here. It says, notable events were mar marked by the year it happened. If we go to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, chapter 2, 1. There it is. And it says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream. So, It was such a notable event in Nebuchadnezzar's life that it was noted in the second year. Okay? Now, we go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Another notable event. Daniel had a dream about four kingdoms represented by a statue. And then in the third one, in chapter 8, verse 1, in the third year 
of the reign of Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. And that's the vision of the wheels, within the wheels. So it could have been any year, fifth year, 12th year. But why these particular years? Because a notable event happened in that year. Okay? So I, I, I want to say to us that this is going to be a notable year. Something that people will remember. Who here remembers the Toronto Vineyard Movement? Amen? I just happened to live in Detroit at the time and went up there several times. And I'll never forget what I saw there. I saw some stuff to me that was weird. People barking. Um, I saw people growling like lions. I saw people. Elaborate. Toronto Vineyard Movement was a revival that hit the Toronto area, and people from all over the world went there, and it lasted for about two and a half years. And and um, all kinds of stuff. Um, I think they brought. I think the Lord brought back the Holy Roller Movement because I went to a church in 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 the Detroit area. This lady, she. She fell out in the spirit, and she rolled across the floor and laughed. She stopped, she rolled back, and she laughed some more. She did that for about t 10 minutes straight, rolling back, laughing. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, everybody in the seat started laughing. Oh, laughing at her, probably. But anyway, um, she was a holy roller. A lot of good music, the vineyard. Yes, and so it was a notable event that happened at that time in church history. Just like the Brownsville revival. I'm sure you guys are more familiar with that because it's a little bit closer than Toronto. Okay? That was the laughing movement from, you know, and uh, I'll never forget. One day I'm sitting in the back row and that whole side of the church start laughing. Ah! I just like, these people are weird. And then all of a sudden, I'm laughing. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I'm like, I guess I'm weird too. <laughs> okay? But it was a notable event, not only in church history, but in my own mind, in my own, something grand happened. A lot of people got saved. A lot of people rededicated their lives to the Lord. This isn't something that the church manufactured. This was the year of the king. He stood up and decided it's time for me to refresh my people. Amen. Okay? And I truly believe that the year of the king is the Lord gets up and refreshes his people. Weary, battle-worn saints of God going through it. And the Lord says it's time. Yep. Amen. It's time. Okay? It's time for me to do a work. And there's nothing anybody in the body is going to do. Just sit back, relax. I got this covered. Okay? I got this covered. Sure, he, sure, he, he, he says, oh, hey, John, come here. I want you to help me with this. Okay? I want you to lead some revival music. Okay? But it's not like John's going to come get stand up and say, I think I want to do some revival music. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let me get behind my piano here. Oh, 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 oh. Okay? No, the Lord stands up and says, it's time, John. It's, good, it's, good, it's, good. it's time. It does, it's not by coincidence that these little ministries are popping up good, in good. this body. Because the Lord is saying, it's time. It's time for a notable event to happen in the Christian gathering. It's time for a notable event to happen in Valley View. It's time for a notable event to happen in North Texas. It's time for a notable event. Amen? So... I'm looking forward to it, okay? I, I, be truthful. Amen, 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 clap, because he's, he's, 
he's about to, he's, I don't know if he's started or he's already started, but I think he's already started. Because, you know, ministries just don't spontaneously pop up, okay? They can, and they usually die out quickly. But when the Lord stands up and starts a ministry, it becomes a notable event, okay? I'm looking forward to it. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah. Amen. Um, well, I see it's 12 o'clock-ish, and I hear that um, people's, what is that I hear? Stomach's grumbling. Whoa. Okay. David, is that your stomach over there? And Trey's stomach. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, anyway, so this is what I wanted to bring to y'all today. Or if I say it Detroit style, to use guys. I'm going to bring it to use guys. Um, I truly believe that um, a notable event is coming. I truly believe that the affinity is coming where we see God as Father. Not just God. Oh, God, help me. See... One thing Jesus brought to the nation of Israel that they didn't have before he showed up was the understanding that God was Father. You know, it's amazing to me that as I've traveled around the country and been to many churches, how many Christians still see God as God. They don't see him as Father. When you see the Lord is Father, then it becomes personal. Amen. And when it becomes personal, then you learn how to be personal with others. But if he's just God up there, then those around you are just people over there. But when you see him as Father connection, Amen. he teaches you how to connect with others. Amen. Okay? And the Lord is saying, it's time for my people to connect, Amen. to show what it means to be in the family of God. Amen. Amen. I'm looking forward to it because, you know, I, like I was telling someone the other night, um, who was I? I don't remember. I was telling somebody, I guess I'm getting old, anyway. Um, I was telling somebody the other night, I grew up in a family environment where there was no love. Literally, was no love. But God, through all the hard things, the scenario with my f best friend just disappearing, and he showed me that he's not going to abandon me. He loves me. He loves me better than my best friend. He loves me better than my parents. Okay? And so, God is wanting to show forth his love Amen. to a lost and dying world. But we can't give what we don't learn. Amen? If we don't learn that God is our Father who loves us, who cares for us, who's got our back, who makes a peace for us, who shows all those aspects of love, how can we give out what we don't have? Okay, it's time for the church to realize who we are. We are the son and the daughters of the Most High God. He loves me, and because he does, I can love others. Amen? Amen? We're going to get out of our comfort zones, Amen. okay? We're going to get into the God zone Amen. because he is moving. Amen. He has decided to stand up and do a work. Amen. Ding! There goes the 12 o'clock bell. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I like to bring a little humor in because sometimes messages can get really weighty. So anyway, Father God, thank you for showing us that you are the king and you are standing up 
to do a work, Amen. to negotiate peace treaties, to judge our hard cases of our personal lives and the cases around us, and that you go out to battle for us. We thank you, Father God, that you do all this for us because you're our Father and you love us. We just ask that you cement what we have heard today in our hearts and in our minds. And we give you all the praise and the glory in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.